expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started, all engines are started. We have ignition. Two weeks ago I challenged my audience to make the best render they can on the theme of space for a chance to win this, a RTX 3090 Ti. Now this card's been supplied by Nvidia and Scan and they've also sponsored this video. All of the entries for that competition are now in, the deadline has passed, I'm going to be pouring over those in the next few days with a couple of guest judges to pick out a winner. If you aren't lucky enough to win the competition but you want to get your hands on some RTX hardware anyway, you should check out the link in the description to see Scan's whole range of laptops, desktops and standalone GPUs. It's all part of Nvidia's RTX Studio program which means it's been certified to give you great performance in creative apps like Blender and Photoshop. But I can let you guys have all the fun, I'm a really big fan of spaceflight myself so I was dying to make a render of my own. So this is the story of how I did it. So right from the very start of this project I actually made a huge mistake. I only gave myself a few days to complete this animation but I had no real plan for how I wanted it to look. Usually at the start of a project I make a storyboard or I at least come up with a pretty concrete plan of how I want all the shots to look in my head but this time I had nothing. Now the reason that's such a big problem is because my whole workflow relies on me working quickly and dirty and I can only do that if I have a good idea of how all the shots will look in the final animation. But in this case, all I knew was that I was going in to make an Apollo era rocket launch, probably in the style of some 1960s TV coverage. Now since I had no plan here, I ended up wasting tons of time modelling out tiny little details that would never ever appear in the final render. I realised that I was probably going overboard with the details when I found myself replicating the iridescent effect on the nozzles of the tiny little RCS thrusters. There's no way those shots would ever show that off, it's just a waste of time. So once I realised I was doing that, I just found a F1 model, F1 engine on Sketchfab. I added that to the rocket and I just called it done. The mobile launch pad was pretty straightforward, but I did also make a mistake here as well. I didn't check that all the references were of the same thing. You see, there's been quite a few different mobile launch pads over the years. They all have a different structure for various rockets. And I did have to go back and basically correct some problems that I'd made there. That wasn't much of an issue. The wireframe modifier always comes in really handy to quickly model out structural elements like these railings around the side of the launch pad. I also use them to model out the whole launch pad tower including this little grilled floor effect. I was really impressed with the performance of Blender and this 3090 Ti graphics card here. I mean considering this building has literally millions of polygons, Blender was handling flawlessly and it was rendering out really quick. This tower is actually just made from a single floor and I used the array modifier to duplicate it many times all the way up the structure. Now I did make the mistake at some point of applying this modifier which made editing a little bit slow but apart from that it wasn't much of an issue. To create the water effect in front of the launch pad I just added a plane with a shiny black metal material. I gave the plane a bunch of loop cuts and I added a displacement modifier. If you add an empty into the scene, you can set that object as the displacement texture's coordinates. Now when you move the empty around the scene, it'll actually drag the texture with it. So if you animate the empty to move up and down, it makes this fairly realistic wave effect on the surface. Now the smoke for the next part took a good bit of time to fine tune before I was happy with it. I basically just made a very basic shape of the flame trench and I used that as a deflection object for the volume. Then I added a fluid emitter that would sit just underneath the engines and I'll set that to fire in smoke mode. Now if you go into the smoke settings you can add an attribute node and you can just type flame into there and if you plug that into the emission strength that'll give you some nice fairly realistic looking flames where the hot parts are. To set the actual colour of the flames I use the black body node which gives you a much more realistic colouring. 
Now that looked pretty good, but it wasn't lighting up the scene as much as I liked. So I did add a strong light that sits just underneath the engine and I added another one at either side of the flame trench so that would make it look like the fire is sort of shining through the smoke. Nvidia's latest graphics cards have access to something called Nano VDB which is a much faster way of rendering volumetrics. I was really happy to have that here because volumetrics are always very slow to work with at the best of times so anything that speeds that process up and helps you to iterate and make changes on how the volumes will look is going to be a big help. The arms for the launch tower should have technically all been a little bit different but I realised that's one of those little details no one would notice so I just made them all identical to save time. There's no advanced rigging or any constraints or anything here, I basically just keyframed all of the parts so that they would move into place with the animation. To make these uh, tubes move when the umbilical connection at the end moves, I just used the hook modifier. You can just select one of the handles of a curve and press Ctrl H and then select hook to a new object. That creates an empty in the scene and if you move the empty around then it will move the curve. So then you can just parent the empty to the umbilical and the curve will move like it's attached to the umbilical object. So now that all of the launch sequence parts were in place, I decided to make another shot which would be in Earth's orbit and it would be the launch escape system ejecting from the top of the capsule. That's the part of the rocket that's designed to yank the capsule off the rest of the rocket if the rocket starts to explode. In reality that's actually ejected much earlier into the flight than I'm showing here, but I'm using a little bit of artistic license. I won't really go over how I made this planet because I recently did a tutorial all about making space scenes and also Andrew Price just put out a really fantastic tutorial all about making a result that looks pretty much identical to this of planet Earth. Now space renders often show objects as either being completely lit or in shadow with the idea that basically there's no reflected lighting. But actually there is something called planet shine when you're in low earth orbit which is basically light being reflected off the planet lighting up the shadows a little bit. So to replicate that here I just added a little blue light that was next to the capsule and I parented it to it so that as the capsule moved through space it would always have the same little bit of light on the shadow side. Now the final two shots in this piece were just made in one day basically on a whim. I realised that it was a little bit anticlimactic to have a rocket launch to the moon and not actually have any shots on the moon. So I started working on this very last minute moon shot. Now I started off with a model of the moon EVA suit which was actually just made for 3D printing. Now the problem with STL files is they usually have really horrible topology. That's not obviously a problem when you're 3D printing but it can cause issues if you're using the model for anything else. Now that wasn't actually much of a problem here though, if anything it might have been a little bit of an improvement because this suit's supposed to be, look like it's covered in fabric. So the lack of any solid topology around the seams actually worked in my favour I think. But it did cause an issue in a few different places like the seam where the helmet meets and it should have a clean edge. So all I did is I just added a new sphere into the scene and I kind of shaped it so it would match the proportions of the opening of the helmet. The ground texture was just a photo set from textures.com of some footprints and sand and I just desaturated it a little bit. I didn't bother with any displacement for this because I knew that it was going to be in the background of the shot and it would be out of focus so you couldn't really tell. Now to make the ground look a little bit more natural I subdivided it a bunch of times and I used the fractal setting in the subdivision to make it look like the surface was more uneven. Then I just went in with the sculpting tools and I added a couple of little hills on the horizon. Now I thought it would be quite cool to add an American flag and I spent ages messing around with cloth sims trying to get something that would look right. The Apollo flags all had this metal bar that ran across the top of the flag to keep it extended. I tried using pin groups to get the flag into that shape but I could never get it to look like it was sort of waving in the wind or like it had some creases in it. Even with a ridiculously strong wind blowing on it, you couldn't get it to look like it was an actual flag that's been put there in a vacuum. It just looked terrible. But then I remembered that Blender has awesome cloth sculpting brushes, which for some reason I just haven't used for ages. So in the end, I just sculpted it in the shape. I added a really basic rig to this character just so I could give him some subtle movements. Now this STL file for some reason didn't play very well with Blender here and it couldn't add automatic weights to the mesh no matter what I tried. So eventually I just went in and I manually painted out the weights for all the bones. Since the movement was so subtle that looked fine it didn't really have to be perfect anyway. 
With the moonshot complete, the animation was technically done, but the transition from the planet shot to the surface of the moon seemed a little bit sudden. I decided to quickly add a last minute shot from inside the spacecraft approaching the moon. So I started this by just modeling out the moon and rendering out a shot of that which I put on a plane. Then I built this really basic window which is quite similar to the pilot window on the lunar lander. I also managed to find a model of an Apollo Aero capsule on Sketchfrab, I think it's by the Smithsonian, and I just cannibalized that for parts. Now most of this model that I found was pretty basic and low resolution, but it was perfect for just adding a few random details to the cockpit which was mostly going to be out of focus anyway. I was really impressed with how well this played back in the viewport, especially once I turned on Nvidia's Optics Denoiser and could basically preview this shot in real time. Now that came in really handy because in this case there's actually a focus pull. As the shot zooms in on the moon, the rest of the cockpit goes kind of out of focus. It's much easier to judge the timing of a focus shift when you can actually just preview it in real time in the viewport like this. Once the render was done, I didn't really do a ton of post work, but I did add this filter that comes with DaVinci Resolve, which makes the whole animation look like it's been recorded in kind of bad quality on the videotape. So after a little bit of sound design, this is what the final animation looks like when it's all put together. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started, all engines are started, we have ignition. Now I'm pretty happy with how most of that came out. The main problem that I have is with the smoke. For some reason just before I rendered this out, Blender decided to overwrite the smoke cache that I'd done in a very high resolution, so I had to quickly re-simulate all the smoke at a much lower resolution and that does kind of hurt it a little bit, but it wasn't the end of the world. Other than that, I thought things went pretty well though. I want to give a big shout out to Nvidia and Scan for sponsoring this series of videos and for supplying the graphics card that one of you guys will be taking home. I'll be assembling a crack team of judges to look over the entries with me for the next few days and then we'll be announcing a winner in a few days time, so stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching.